Hi there, everybody. You have been watching for the better part of the day. Uh, this proceeding in Fulton County. Just now, you're listening to the closing arguments at a courthouse in Atlanta on the disqualification efforts to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis from her sprawling RICO case against the ex-president and his co-defendants. You were listening there before the rebuttal began to Adam Abadi from the DA's office mounting a defense against allegations that Fonnie Willis financially benefited from the case by appointing Nathan Wade as a special prosecutor. Both Fonnie Willis and Wade have testified under oath that they were in a romantic relationship, but that it did not begin until after Wade was hired. The defense has shown no concrete evidence that Willis profited from hiring Wade, and today the DA's office described the defense's star witness as a, quote, disgruntled, vengeful speculator. That witness earlier this week crumbled on the stand. He testified that he did not actually know when the relationship between the two started. Now, the fate of Willis and the entire RICO case will soon be in the hands of the judge. That's Judge Scott McAfee. If he decides to disqualify the district attorney, then her whole office risks losing this case against Donald Trump. Let's bring in MSNBC host and legal analyst Katie Fang. She's outside the Atlanta courthouse. Also joining us, former Republican congressman, our friend, MSNBC political analyst David Jolly. Uh, Katie Fang, um, take me through the importance of what transpired and tell us what might happen next. So we did hear a long presentation by a number of defense attorneys as to why the judge should disqualify Fonnie Willis. But you notice that during the defense's presentation of its closing arguments, and then when the state just had the opportunity to get up and do it, the court actually peppered the defense several times with certain questions that indicated that he had some skepticism in terms of whether the legal standard had actually been met by the defense in this case. There were a couple of highlights that I wanted to bring to your attention, Nicole, that came from Judge McAfee, one of which was really important. So it was this question as to when could you make a determination as to when Terrence Bradley was lying. So Terrence Bradley's name has been brought up so many times, Nicole. He's the former defense attorney for Nathan Wade. He was supposed to be the star witness for the defense. In fact, the evidence was reopened for the purposes of Bradley to have to testify again. However, Bradley indicated that he was providing pure speculation when he texted with Ashley Merchant, who's the defense attorney for political operative for the GOP, Mike Roman. So the thing that we're kind of focusing on here, Nicole, is this idea that Bradley was supposed to be presented to impeach these witnesses. He was supposed to be able to take the stand and say that these other witnesses like Wade and Willis, et cetera, would have lied or were lying on the stand. And yet Bradley didn't impeach anyone. In fact, he impeached himself when he said that the texts that he sent were just based on speculation. Another question that came from Judge McAfee that was very telling, is the court supposed to police people that take the stand and lie. Isn't that what you do with lawyers? Aren't you supposed to send them down the street to the bar is what Judge McAfee asked, indicating what is he supposed to do with this idea that Wade and Willis, as members of the Georgia bar, have lied. And he's going through an academic exercise, I think, with a lot of these defense attorneys when he's been asking questions. But there's been some, I guess, criticism is the word I would use um, on social media and other places about the presentation by the state. You know, it wasn't as it wasn't as, I guess, compelling, and yet in some ways it was, Nicole. And the reason why is you have to reduce this to just the facts and the evidence. This, there's no jury in this courtroom. It's just Judge McAfee. And the back and forth that we saw between the state and the judge when it focused on the law was critically important because that is what the judge has to rely upon when he makes this decision. He has to make his decision not based on any type of emotion, not based on whether or not he personally has an issue with what transpired between Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis. He has to focus on only the facts and the evidence. And so with the state getting up and making legal arguments that feeds directly into McAfee's questions to the defense as to whether the burden, the preponderance of the evidence standard that must be met by the defense has been achieved and at this point, he really didn't have any strong, very harsh questioning for the state versus, I think, what he had for the defense, which are some really probing questions. David Jolly, there's a movie, um, I think it's called Why You Were Sleeping. I think Sandra Bullock stars in it. Um, <laughs> and all this stuff happens and they wake up and they're like, what? What happened? So before I went out on maternity leave, 
People were flipping on Donald Trump faster than, you know, the temperature dropped right. before 32 in New York. Um, and I come back, and while I was sleeping, while I was away, um, something that transpired in Funny Willis's personal life now her, has her at the sort of um, hinge sure. moment of perhaps losing this case and perhaps the case against Donald Trump, the sprawling RICO case involving his efforts to overturn a presidential election and specifically his defeat in Georgia. Crimes that happen on an um, open phone line, not in the sit room, on a secure line, um, are, are very much in the um, in question. What are your thoughts as you watch all this? Yeah, Nicole, first of all, the whole world missed you. I know I missed you, but the whole oh, world missed you. Nicole Wallace. But <laughs> listen, I don't know that you missed that much. I mean, Taylor Swift is now part of the deep state. Donald Trump is peddling gold <laughs> shoes. Um, we're all trying to remember the speaker of the House's actual name uh, and democracy still going to hell. But other than that, like, you know, fine. it's pretty much how you left it. <laughs> Everything's fine, right? <laughs> um, but look, I, I, I think in this case, for people who are not lawyers like Katie Fang and not skilled with the courtroom as she is, to the layperson, this sounds and looks a lot like the House Republicans' investigation of Hunter Biden. It's like, what are you? What are we really talking about, and what are we trying to get to the bottom of? Because this has nothing to do with the actual indictment, the allegations of election tampering in the state of Georgia. And and so I think for non-lawyers and for people who are worried about justice and democracy, you're right to kind of feel maybe accountability is beginning to slip away because that is this is one of those weeks between the high court's decision on taking the case on immunity and now what we're seeing in the courtroom. But I, I would also say. That this, if the lawyers are actually arguing in front of the judge, whether or not the standard is appearance of conflict of interest or actual conflict of interest, once again, you've lost the American people. But I would suggest that hopefully justice actually does win the day here, because if if Trump's lawyers and the defendant's lawyers are arguing that the standard only needs to be appearance of conflict of interest, that's because they know that they failed to establish a real conflict of interest. That said, to Katie's point, the judge has to consider the law and the facts as he sees it. And this is kind of all or nothing for whether or not there's going to be accountability in Georgia. It's hard to see this case surviving the disqualification of Fonnie Willis.